I'm really, really excited uh, to be continuing our year-long series on the topic of translation with a talk today on uh, translation of human social behavior into, uh, let's say, the, uh, the language of the machine, into robotic uh, behavior. As some of you know, our series has already presented work on the status of scientific illustration in uh, early modern Europe, on computational analysis of language processing uh, among users of American Sign Language, both hearing and non-hearing, a very interesting talk, um, and on the cultural costs of fossil fuel extraction and transport um, technologies among native peoples in, in the Northern Plains. That was our, our most recent event. Um, so these are all areas where the humanities converge with the sciences in various ways around shared questions for research. There are, to be sure, other um, more traditionally or narrowly humanistic areas. Uh, we have an event coming up on art and food. That will not be food science, uh, but um, it will be um, uh, a, a humanities event in a more traditional way. We have an event coming up on uh, Jack Kerouac, the uh, canonical American writer who was born French-Canadian and did some fairly extensive writings in French that are only just now coming out uh, in English. So, um, so we do highlight work in those areas this year, as always. Nevertheless, the Humanities Forum is a center for consilience. It's a deliberately curated contact zone where uh, the, the old two cultures of science versus the humanities are always understood as potential partners in the production of new knowledge. My colleague, Bethany Wigan, who's topic director of the translation series, is a noted scholar of German literature and the European novel, who's also the leader of Penn's program in environmental humanities. That is a program that involves faculty in biology, medicine, earth and environmental science, as well as law, architecture, media studies, and I could go on. So Bethany knows better than anyone how to make space for truly interdisciplinary thinking about large and difficult objects of concern. She will introduce our speaker, Professor Scassolati. Please welcome Bethany Wigan. Thank you, Jim, for that introduction, and thank you to all of you for coming um, today. Jim's um, introduction made our concerns sound very lofty, and in fact, they are. But I was confessing to Professor Scassolati in the hallway before we came in, when Jim and I were initially at the very outset of curating this series, what I said was, let's find the guys who work on fuzzy robots. <laughs> so. That's uh, the true confession. Professor Scassolati is a professor of computer science, cognitive science, and mechanical engineering at Yale. He also directs um, the National Science Foundation's expedition on socially assisted robots. This expedition has partners at the Social Robotics Lab at Yale, which Professor Scassolati also directs, has, part, is a, has a partner in the MIT Media Lab at the University of Southern California School of Engineering and at Stanford Center for Work Technology and Organization. The NSF expedition defines its mission to be, and I'm quoting now, to develop the computational techniques that will enable the design, implementation, and evaluation of robots that encourage social, emotional, and cognitive growth in children, including those with social or cognitive deficits. So their robots really are soft and fuzzy, and they look a lot like my children's stuffies, their stuffed animals, and their rubber duckies. And not only are these robots meant to look like children's toys, but they are meant to learn much as children learn. That is, according at least to a fascinating um, article I read in the New York Times Magazine about sociable robots, these robots have bodies and they can be programmed to use these bodies as part of their own data gathering. So instead of starting out with everything they need to know already programmed in them, the robots learn about the world the way babies do starting with some simple competencies and adding to them through sensory input. So for babies, the sensory input would include, as, as you know, if you 
have a baby or were a baby, seeing, touching, and balancing. And for robots, that means input from mechanical sensors like video cameras and gyroscopes. Professor Scasolati received his PhD in computer science from MIT. At MIT. He focused on two well-known humanoid robots named Cog and Kismet. Um, his research in social robotics and assistive robotics has been recognized very widely, including in that New York Times Magazine piece that I cited to you, covered in the Wall Street Journal, Popular Science, um, and it has been awarded numerous and many prizes. I'll simply name two. He has been the recipient of an NSF Career Award, and in 2007 was named an Alfred P. Sloan Fellow. Professor Scasolati. So thank you first, Jim and Bethany. Uh, I don't often get such a nice introduction, uh, and it's much appreciated. Um, I'm really happy to be here today. I have uh, a lot of robot video to show you, um, and I'm hoping that I'll be able to convince you in some way that even though the things you're going to see have a very large amount of serious engineering and computational efforts behind them, that these have impacts on real people in the real world on everyday tasks. And so the things I'm going to show you aren't set up from uh, sort of very carefully controlled settings. They're out there in schools and hospitals and malls and on the street. And that's what I want to show you today. But I want to start uh, with just setting the scene. And for that, I want to show you my favorite robot in the entire world. It's not fuzzy. But it does do an amazing task. And it does it better than any robot or any human can perform this task. And it sorts hot dogs. <laughs> this robot, built by IMT, sorts hot dogs and sausages faster and more accurately than any other system on Earth. A pile of, of different sausages come in on this conveyor belt from the bottom, and the robot has an arm that swivels around and moves over top of it while it's moving and drops down, and using vacuum pressure, a little suction cup, it grabs hold of the sausage without injuring it in any way, spins it around very quickly, and drops it down into this nice, neat line so that it can go through a plastic packaging machine. When this thing is in operation, you don't see the robot moving. You just see a blur. It's so fast that all you see are hot dogs flying in from one side and flying out the other side in a nice, neat row. This is what traditional robots do extremely well. They do things over and over again, repetitively. They do things with very high precision. No human could stack sausages quite this neatly. And this thing operates continuously for 363 days a year. This is what traditional robots are like. They do jobs that in robotics we call the three Ds, jobs that are dirty, dull, and dangerous. They go off and they weld car doors on assembly lines, or they explore the surface of other planets, or they inspect sewer and oil pipelines, or they defuse bombs. Jobs that we don't want to be performing because they're dirty, dull, or dangerous. That's the traditional engineering world of robots. But in the last 20 years, that started to change. In the same way that computers in the 1960s and 70s were these giant room-sized devices that were reserved for very careful scientific computation, but that through the 80s became commercial products that everyone could buy and have in their homes. Robots are becoming this same sort of commercial device. So now, rather than seeing the room-sized versions, we're starting to see the personal things that you can go out and buy at Best Buy or Target. Robots that aren't doing dirty, dull, or dangerous jobs. They're designed for 
entertainment. They're designed to perform simple household tasks like vacuuming or mowing the lawn. They're designed not to provide that continuous operation, high precision movement that the old robots were designed to do, but rather they're designed to be interactive and friendly and easy to use. And that's changed entirely the kind of engineering that we perform. Now we don't measure success in terms of how long the robot operates or how many millimeters off each sausage is. But we measure it in terms of how easy is it for my grandmother to take it out of a box and use? How many times do people have to read the instructions before they're able to use it? How well does it mow the lawn without running over the garden hose? This transformation from industrial to commercial is something that we've known has been coming for years now. It's the natural progression for technology. It's best summed up by a one-page ad that Honda took out in both Time Magazine and the New York Times in 2002. And this was that ad. No words required. The message was very clear and very simple. The robots are coming, and they're going to be part of your home, part of your family. That was in 2002. Now, I still can't go out and buy this thing and put it in my house and have it wash my dishes, but we know that transformation is coming. So as I was thinking about our theme, translation, I realized that what I really do is I translate what we know about social behavior, about that interactive response between humans, and I put it into a mechanical form. So in the process of translating social behavior, we sometimes have to make changes, but we try to keep the essence of what we're conveying the same. Let me give you a very simple example of that. This is from a tutoring system that we use with fifth and sixth graders right now. And this is out in public schools in Connecticut, uh, in and around, uh, well actually I'm not supposed to say what city it's in. Let's say they're in a city near a large university in Connecticut. <laughs> and you can guess where that is. But here's one of our robots tutoring with a, a fifth grader. So she's working hard at this. She tries to cheat the robot a little bit, but eventually goes back to pencil and paper and then later gets the problem correct. Well done. Keep going. Now the behavior of this robot is designed to engage her. It's designed to keep her motivated and working on these challenging problems. And I'll tell you right now, she doesn't want to do that. The robot is using these social behaviors in order to convince her that she should do that, to motivate her to keep going. And it does that both through its voice and the words that it's saying, but also through its attention and where it's looking and where it's pointing and how it's gesturing. When we translate, we have to take the things that we know are important and put them into these mechanical devices. Now, sometimes, when we get this right, it works seamlessly and without any effort. And to show you that, I want to tell you a story from the first robot that I ever worked with, which was a large humanoid, an upper torso robot named Cog. And this is a much younger picture of me. <laughs> wow. Uh, standing next to this robot, and the robot is somewhat in the background there. It's actually uh, taller than I am. And this robot is one that we built from scratch. I knew every piece of this robot. I knew every piece of metal, every spring, every gear, 
and every line of software in that robot. And that's important. We'll come back to that. But one of the jobs that I had was to program the robot so that it would look and focus on things that were important. And so we built an attention system for the robot to direct its visual attention to different targets in the environment. And so the robot, and here's a close-up of its head, would be looking off in one direction, and then something would attract its attention, something that would move, or something that was brightly colored, or something that was uh, perhaps a face. And all of a sudden, the robot would turn its eyes and turn its neck and focus directly on that target. Now, I wrote this attention system, and the robot was designed after 14 and a half seconds to get bored with a target and to go back and look somewhere else. And as part of testing this process, I sat across the table from the robot. And I would sit and I would type away and write a few lines of code. And as part of the process, I had to have the robot turned on so that I could test it. And so for a while, I would type, and the robot would see the movement, and it would turn, and it would look at me. And I would immediately look up at the robot. I'd lose focus with what I was doing, and I'd look at the robot. Now, I knew exactly why that had happened. And I would say, I've got to focus. I've got to concentrate. I've got to finish my thesis. And so 14 and a half seconds later, the robot would go and look somewhere else. And I'd go back to typing away. And sure enough, 14 and a half seconds later, the robot would see my hands moving, and it would turn and look at me again. And I'd look up at it. And I tried for three weeks to train myself not to look at the robot, because I really wanted to graduate. <laughs> and I couldn't finish writing in, fifth, in 14 and a half second chunks. And I would get to the point where I could really concentrate hard and I could ignore the robot looking at me for a few times. And then about a minute in, all of a sudden it would look at me and I would look up at it. And I'd sit there and I'd think, how stupid am I? I know exactly why it's doing this. I know exactly when it's coming. And I couldn't resist. When we translate things into the mechanical form and we get it just right, we respond as humans to that stimulus as we would to any other social stimulus. It's effortless on our part. It's automatic on our part. We can't resist. I eventually figured out that I could put a giant mirror between me and the robot, and the robot would happily look around all over the place and I could get some work done. But I couldn't train myself to ignore it. That's because, in many ways, I'd done my job correctly. Now, sometimes this translation has to be done very precisely. The other robot I worked on when I was in graduate school was this robot named Kismet. Kismet was designed to be cute and attractive. It was about a foot tall. It sat on a desktop. We used to bring in schools full of children, 30, 40 kids at a time, who would come in, and they'd interact with the robot, and it was fun and engaging and playful, and they loved it. And we had probably seen somewhere in the neighborhood of seven or 800 children until we found the one group that hated the robot. We brought in a group of Japanese school children, mostly girls. And they came into the room and they saw the robot. And the robot smiled at them. And we kind of got out of the way because we expected them all to rush up to the robot. And they all stood back against the far wall. And we said, no, 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 it's OK. You can come up. It's all right. It, you're not going to break anything. You're allowed to do this. And they said, no, 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 no. We don't want to get close to the robot. And we looked at it and we said, well, wh why not? And they said, it looks angry. Now, it took us weeks afterwards to figure out why that was. 
Anyone have a clue? It's not about where it's looking, but it is something to do with the eyes. Not the eyebrows. This robot has upper eyelids, but no lower eyelids. For me, I was raised in the U.S., American culture. That has no real meaning to me. I see this robot, I see it, and it looks friendly and enticing. In Japan, you have a culture where expression of emotion is much more based on postural cues rather than facial display. And the one time when you see the white underneath the eye is when someone's inclining their head forward at you in this aggressive posture. And so they saw this big area of white underneath. And even though the robot's smiling at them, and even though it was acting friendly, they said, that thing is angry. So the cues that we have to translate are often cultural as well as social. And we have to get them just right. Nowhere did we expect or nowhere did we have a rule written down saying that lower eyelid is critical. But in fact, it is. Now, the translations that we do have scientific value to us. Because in the same way that when you tr learn to translate, you learn not only about the language that you're translating into, but you learn something about your native tongue as well. And in many cases, when we translate these behaviors from humans into the machine, we end up learning about people. Let me give you an example of that. This is a very old study from 1944 by Heider and Simmel. Um, the stimulus was reproduced by my colleague Brian Scholl. And you can watch these three little arrow shapes move around on a flat screen. But when you watch it, you don't see three little arrow shapes moving around on the screen. And if I ask you to describe it, you tell me the story of what's happening. You can all tell who's frustrated at the end of this. You can tell who were friends. You can tell me the story of bullying that happens here. These are just shapes moving on a screen. This is part of the natural interpretation that we have when we view stimuli. Artists and animators know these rules very well about how to generate this kind of response. A good animator can make what is just a sack of flour jump up and run around and act joyous and then suddenly flop back down and become just a sack of flour again. One of the fundamental cues that we pay attention to is this concept of agency or animacy. And we divide the world up into those things that are social agents or actors and those other things that are just physical objects. And even if they look the same, their behavior determines which category they're in. Now, our work in psychology has shown us that there are lots of these low-level motion-based cues, those rules that animators know, that determine whether something appears to be an agent or an object. One of the things we've uncovered with robots is that they're also cognitive cues. So here's another little humanoid, a robot named Nico. Nico's about two foot tall, was actually designed with the same body dimensions as a one-year-old child. We had people come in and play games of rock, paper, scissors. Rochambeau, every, everyone knows this game, right? We had them play this game over and over again with the robot. And most of our groups, they spent 20 minutes playing rock, paper, scissors. 20 minutes of rock, paper, scissors is the most boring thing you can imagine. And by the end of 20 minutes, I win. You get the most bored undergrads you've ever seen. Yes, I will. We have tied this round. And so every time the robot would throw a gesture, the person would throw a gesture, and the robot would say, I win, or you win, or we've tied this round. Now, after 20 minutes of this, we took one 
opportunity to do something different. For one half of our groups who saw this, the robot would throw a gesture, lose, but incorrectly say, I win. Claim a victory that it had no right to claim. And our undergraduates viewed this as if it were a broken machine. So sure about that. What? We tied. Oh. I don't think so. There was a little bit of confusion, a little bit of surprise, sometimes a, a quick utterance, but then they went back to their normal, boring routine. We actually made them play another 20 minutes after this. And if you thought they were bored in the first 20 minutes, they hated us by the end of 40. The other half got 20 minutes of boring rock, paper, scissors. And then one event where the robot threw a gesture was supposed to lose and suddenly changed its gesture and said, I win. And their response is completely different. Yes, I win. <laughs> yes, I win. I was cheating. Yes, I win. You're tricky. Yes, I win. <laughs> We made them play another 20 minutes. But they sat there for that second 20 minutes on the edge of their seats. They sat there and they talked to the robot the whole time. No one ever talked to the robot before that. They made eye contact with the robot. They later described the robot using active verbs. They personified it. They spoke about how the robot was engaging and interesting and fun to play with. They rated it as smarter, as more complex. They rated it as better looking. I still don't understand that one. <laughs> Everything for them changed and it didn't go away. Those animators who take that sack of flour, it can jump up, run around, fall back down and all of a sudden it's an object again. You lose track of it. This doesn't go away. 20 minutes later, they're still sitting there talking to the robot. The robot's done nothing in 20 minutes. But they still think they're watching it, and they're going to make sure it doesn't cheat again. What's even more interesting is that this works only in one direction. That is, if the robot changes its gesture in order to steal your victory, then it becomes an agent. But if the robot changes its gesture in order to hand you a victory, to throw the game in your favor, there's no response. Here's that same thing with a different robot. So when the robot cheats to lose, it throws the match. Oh, you win. Let's play. Wait, what? Oh, you win. Let's play. Oh, you win. Let's play. But when the robot steals your victory, Yes, I win. Let's play. You can't do that. <laughs> yes, I win. You cheated. You cheated now. Yes, I win. Hey, but let's you play. You cheat. Super cheat. And again, they keep talking to it. They keep engaging with it. They watch it carefully because that sneaky robot is going to do it again any minute now. It becomes more like a person. These are things that are not about robots. When I shoot video, I shoot video not of the robot. I shoot video of the person because that's the, where the interesting thing is happening. Here, we're using the robot as a tool to uncover something in our native tongue, something that's really about how we process the world. My friend Josh Nob, who's a philosopher, he says, think of it this way. If you're walking through the forest 
and you stumble upon a pile of apples perfectly stacked in a pyramid, your first thought is, wow, I'm so lucky. But if you walk through the forest and you find a pit trap, your first thought is, someone's out to get me. The first case, it's your good luck, your good fortune. No one else is acting to bring that to you. In the latter, someone's out to get you. You better pay attention to this. So our translations have to be precise. They have to be culturally appropriate. And sometimes they tell us something about our native tongue. But translation does more than that when we, when we take this from human forms to mechanical forms. Doing that process, translating across that divide, allows us to appreciate some of the commonalities between the two. For us, the commonalities involve primarily the fact that we both have physical forms. Unlike a virtual character on a screen, that robot has a physical size and shape and dimensionality in the world. When we appreciate these commonalities, we actually find, again, something about both. One of the reasons I get asked all the time is, why do you bother to build robots? Why don't you just put things on a, an app, on a tablet or something? And the answer is because it's not the same. Let me show you the commonality. It comes in two flavors. The first one was discovered by an undergraduate in my lab. And she said, I want to study something about how virtual agents are different from physical agents. So we designed a study, an experiment, in which half of the group came in and sat down next to the real physical robot, Nico. The other half sat down next to a great big flat screen showing a two-way video conference with the same robot. In both cases, the robot was programmed to do exactly the same thing. Whether it was sitting there physically in the room or whether it was in another room and being shown on the screen. They were the same size. They had the same field of view. They had the same responses. We asked them to come in and we actually set this up in my office. So we asked undergrads to come into what was clearly a faculty office. And we gave them some mindless tasks to do. Proofread this document, file these folders. And finally, we told them the one thing that was actually important to us. We said, we want you to reshelve some books. The robot knows where the books belong. And the robot, who up until this point had been watching them as they moved around the room and responding to them if they waved, but generally looking completely bored, suddenly perked up and pointed to a pile of books and then pointed to a location on the shelf. And everybody was happy to go over and pick up those books and carry them over and put them on the shelf. But the last pile of books was this great big pile of brand new textbooks, easily four or $500 worth of textbooks sitting on my desk. And the robot points to that pile of books and then points to the trash can. <laughs> and the question is, how many undergrads are willing to take my $500 pile of new textbooks and throw them away because the robot said so? Well, when it was the real physical robot sitting there, 80% of them, or sorry, two-thirds of them, two-thirds of them walked over, picked up the books, walked over to the trash can, dumped them in the trash, turned around like, what's my next job? Zero hesitation at all for two-thirds of them. When it was the robot on the flat screen, even though it did the exact same things, they picked up the books. They all walked over to the trash can. They all knew what the robot wanted but less than 20% of them threw the books away. Most of them tried to negotiate with the robot. <laughs> they said, are you sure? And the robot just pointed to the trash can. 
Most of them at that point tried to put them on a shelf near the trash can. A few of them tried to hide the books behind the trash can. <laughs> One very smart individual tried to fool the robot by putting the books on the floor and putting the trash can on top of the books. <laughs> Anything to get away so that they didn't throw those books away. Now, this is one of the commonalities. Physical presence of the robots, that physical form, makes people more likely to listen to them. It increases what we call compliance in psychology. The same thing's true of people. We teach this in business school. If you want to close the big deal, you don't call, you don't Skype, you go there in person because you're more likely to get a yes when you're standing there in front of the person. That same thing is true in this translated form. Now, here's the thing, one that educators love. There's one more thing that's true about that commonality, and that's that we learn faster when we're physically present. Now, to demonstrate that, we had to find a task that was as abstract as we could make up. So we found this nice little puzzle game. Some people call them nonograms, pick a cross. They have like five or 10 different names. But the goal of them is you start with this blank puzzle and then you fill things in according to some rules that are listed on the rows and on the columns. So if you see this rule on the bottom, it says six and then one. That means I have to shade in six squares together and then have some amount of blank space and then one square. And I can have space at the beginning or space at the end. Now for that bottom row, there's only one way I could do that. With eight squares across, it has to be six, then one, then one. But for something like this row above it that just says seven, well, it could be the first seven or it could be the last seven. Or there's things like this last column, one, one, three. There's a number of different ways that could work. So to work out this problem, I have to do small pieces at a time. In computer science, this is a constraint satisfaction problem. It's NP complete, which means it's as hard of a problem as we get. To do a problem like this, you take little tricks that you learn, little lessons. Like when I see that seven, even if I don't know whether it's the first seven or the last seven, I know those middle six have to be shaded in, right? Doesn't matter which one of those two options it is, those middle six are gonna be shaded in. So I could shade them in right away. And then maybe that gives me something else to work with. Now you can teach people the rules to this puzzle without teaching them those tricks. So we did just that. We took four different groups, and for all of them, we taught them the rules of how to solve this puzzle. Three of the groups then got some hints, these tricks. They got trained on those tricks. The group that got no help at all just sat there on a laptop, worked on four puzzles in a row. The second group got the help. They also just sat on the laptop, and the help just played from the speakers on the laptop. The third and the fourth group, they got the same help, the same audio recordings, the same MP3s. But in the third case, they got them from a little video of a robot. And in the fourth case, they got the same lessons, but from a real physical robot sitting there. Now, these puzzles are hard. A 10 by 10 puzzle will take you about 15 minutes to solve if you've never done these before. We played a really dirty trick on our participants, though, in that we gave them the same puzzle twice. The first puzzle and the last puzzle were exactly the same, only rotated by 90 degrees. And when you do that, the puzzle is exactly the same difficulty, because it's the same puzzle, but no one notices that they're doing the same puzzle anymore. So we could directly compare how quickly you solve the first one with how quickly you solve the last one. Same difficulty. Now if we give you no help at all, 
you still improve your time by about two minutes. You go from 15 minutes solving it to about 13 minutes solving it. If we give you those lessons, either from the disembodied voice or from the little video on the screen, those lessons help. You improve your time by about three and a half or four minutes. But if we give you those same lessons from the robot sitting there on the table, same audio, you improve your time by almost six minutes. There's no good reason this should be true. It's the same information being conveyed to you. But I told you educators love this because this is why you should go to lecture. <laughs> if you just sit in the room, you'll learn more. So that commonality, the thing that we know works in human-to-human -human education, we know that it works with machines as well. Now that's very important for me and what I do because most of my time is not spent designing experiments like this. It's, it's spent building systems that help people. So translation by its nature allows more people to have access to some valuable resource. And for us, that's one-on-one -on -one time. Everyone has something that they want to work on. Everyone has something that they're trying to learn, that they're trying to do better at. We have personal trainers. We have nutrition experts who help us and coach us through things. We have support groups. But we don't have enough people to make that happen. That's especially true with certain subpopulations, certain populations where there's a greater need. And I work specifically often with kids with autism spectrum disorder. Many of these children are in anywhere from five to eight hours of therapy a day. <clears throat> That's an unbelievable amount of effort for a family or for a clinician to support. So our objective is to see whether we can actually provide not five to eight hours a day, but some small fraction of that. What if we could give families back an hour a day? We're not gonna take the place of what those therapists are doing, but maybe we'll lessen their burden a little bit. Now this has been an extremely active area of work with autism spectrum disorder, in part because there's so much need and in part because there's so much potential that people see. So I started doing this back in 2001 with a group of clinicians that included Fred Volkmar and Ami Klin. And they said, when I moved to Yale, they said, why don't you bring one of your robots into the clinic? Show it to one of our kids. And I said, okay, I had no idea what was gonna happen. But the results were so encouraging that it got picked up by other groups all over the world. And with all different kinds of robots, robots that look like more humanoid-like things to really bizarre eye stalks to things that are just round balls and everything in between. And every time we took any of these robots and we put them with kids with ASD, we saw three things happen. The kids got very excited. There was a high degree of motivation. That shouldn't surprise anyone. I gave a child a brand new robot toy and that child got excited. No headline news there, okay? Second thing, we saw sustained interest. They wanted to play with that robot for hours longer than we would let them. Well, perseveration is something that is a common diagnostic for autism. It's not surprising in this case. But the third thing is the one that got everyone excited. And that's that we would, in many children, not all, but in many children, we would see typical social behavior that they weren't using with their, with their family.
families, with their parents, with their peers. They were suddenly doing in the presence of the robot. Now, we were engineers, and we did the absolute terrible, most terrible thing that we could possibly do, which is we took the robot out, we put it in the room with a child, and we saw something, we videotaped it, we recorded it, we wrote a paper on it, and we let it go. We basically did the worst clinical evaluation ever. Okay, we had terribly small sample sizes, we had no quantitative measures, we had no control groups, we had no idea of what diagnostic or inclusionary criteria were, we just took a kid and someone told them us they had autism and we went with it. But the really, the, the, the worst sin that we made in the beginning is that we were so focused on the way the child responded to the robot. And in the end, that didn't matter. It wasn't how the child responded to the robot that was useful. Because training kids to respond to robots, no one cares about that. What was important is how they took what was happening with the robot and translated it to their interactions with people. So I'm going to show you one of the first studies that was done by my grad student, Ellie Kim, who's actually um, a postdoc here at Penn now uh, over at Children's Hospital. And she was working with this little robot dinosaur named Pleo. And we took Pleo and we put it into a typical therapy session for kids with ASD. Many of the therapy sessions are behavioral therapy. So you basically practice a scenario and you repeat it over and over again. We took a group of kids who were working on a skill called vocal prosody. That is, they were high functioning and verbal kids. They knew the right words to say, but they, sounded, they made them sound inappropriate. So we would say to them, you just won your soccer game, how do you feel? And the kids would say, I feel great. Like someone had just stepped on their dog and dropped their ice cream cone. They had that, the wrong tone of voice. And so we would have these therapy sessions with them where we would give them a scenario. Imagine that I hand you an ice cream cone. What do you say to me? And it wasn't important what words they chose. It was important how they said it. So we took one of the standard therapy sessions and we replaced the human therapist with the robot. In this case, we took them in front of this little play mat with the dinosaur robot, and we told them that the robot was afraid of water. And the robot would walk across the play mat, and it would come up to a river, and it would act scared. It would shake, and it would drop its head, and it would sound scared. And the child's job was to say something that sounded encouraging. And I want to show you one 12-year-old boy as a sample of this. And I'm going to show you his behavior before we bring the robot out with the robot and then after the robot goes away. And I want you to look for two things. I want you to watch for the difference before and after in his behavior. And second, I want you to look for one very particular behavior. It's called social referencing. It's when you glance at someone else just to see that things are okay. In this case, he's going to glance to the woman in the brown shirt, who's been his therapist for a couple of years at this point. He knows her very well. We never see him do social referencing. So here he is before. Yeah, well now they're gathering dust. I really got to play with them again. Okay, so they're just sitting in a box mm -hmm. somewhere. Yeah. What kind of games do you play? What kind of games do I play with them? Like battles, mini battles. He doesn't make eye contact. He doesn't even want to face us. Then the robot comes out. There's social <laughs> referencing right there. He's going to do it a couple more times in the next minute. You can do it, come on, Cleo. You can do it. Let's cross that river, come on. He's working hard. He's doing a good job. And he's going to do a little social reference again right there. Think he's funny? Yeah. <laughs> One more time. You're going to see him do it again. Yeah. 
And you hit it when you were doing something? I don't remember. I must have banged it or... But just one day I tried, I tried to turn it on and it just wasn't working right. It just... everything was fuzzy? Yeah. And, what, and did it have any sound when you turned it on? That's after five minutes with the robot. All of a sudden, he's not quite oriented toward her, but he's making eye contact. He's asking questions. He's engaged in the conversation. His parents are sitting behind the one-way mirror over here. And their first question to me is, how much for the robot? <laughs> okay. Um, this is incredibly hard, actually, on the parents. Because this happens. And they see this dramatic change, this behavior that he never does naturally. And he walks out of the room, and 15 minutes later, it's gone. But notice, this wasn't behavior directed at the robot. This is behavior directed at a person. The presence of the robot triggered it, somehow. This doesn't happen if we use puppets. This doesn't happen if we use virtual characters. Something special about the robot. So we started thinking about this. We said, this is, we've got to be able to do something here to help these kids. So we said, would you be willing to come back tomorrow? And they said, yes. And so we brought them back the second day. And the same thing happened. He came in, was making eye contact, social referencing. It's great. We said, would you come back again tomorrow? And they said, yes. Came back the third day. And you know what? Didn't quite work. He had a bad day. Everybody has a bad day once in a while. Come back the fourth day. Doesn't work. No change in his behavior. Fifth day, no change. But that's not unusual. If I tell you the same joke four days in a row, it stops being funny. Doing the same thing over and over again gets boring quickly. So we started to think about this, and we said, we shouldn't expect this to work, doing exactly the same thing day after day. But our robots weren't smart enough to do anything else. So we did what all good academics do. We wrote a grant and tried to get a lot of money for it. And NSF was very obliging after the fourth or fifth time asking them. We said, what if we could take a robot and actually have it customize itself to that particular child. All the kids that we were looking at were all different. They all had different abilities, different things that they had trouble with. What if we could get a robot that could grow and change with that child, to not be doing the same boring thing day after day, but still be engaging? And perhaps most interesting, what if we could do it in a way where it engaged them in the way that we know that they learn best, which is as a peer rather than as a parent or an instructor. Kids learn more from each other than they do from adults. That's just the fact of the matter. Parents, we don't like to think about that fact, but it's true. And so for the last five years or so, we've had this fantastic team of people building robots that teach. We've worked with teaching first graders nutrition. If you think first graders want to learn about fiber, you would be wrong. <laughs> unless it happens to come from a little cute fuzzy dragon robot. We've taught third graders about how to deal with bullies. We've taught math to fifth and sixth graders. We've taught adolescents how to deal with anger. And we're teaching six and 12 month old infants who are deaf about language and communication. And let me show you just one quick sample of that. Since I couldn't give up on the translation idea here, we see a lot of kids in public schools in a city near a large university in Connecticut who speak Spanish and Portuguese at home and who get put into a public school and who struggle. So we thought, We'll go in and we'll talk to the teachers. And we said to the teachers, we said, what's the worst problem that you face? And they said, well, the biggest thing is we have no idea what the kids learn, ha, actually know and what they don't know. Because you ask them a question and they don't answer. You ask them a question and you get no response from them. And that's because they know that they might get it wrong. 
So we said, what if we get a robot who can actually personalize to what a child can do? So here's a robot that personalizes instruction around the Spanish verb hacer. Hacer, you translate into English as either make or do. You do your homework, you don't make your homework. You make your bed, you don't do your bed. It's context sensitive. And here's a robot getting kids to make mistakes. I need my gorro extra. Por favor, también dile que haga espacio para mi gorro en inglés. You can do a space more. Bueno, estamos listos para irnos. Deberíamos de hacer un baile para celebrar todo nuestro trabajo duro. Dilas po en inglés que. So he makes a mistake. Don't you don't make space. You don't do more space or do a space more, as he says. And because of that, the robot's able to recognize that he has problem with that particular construction and we change the story and we repeat those constructions that he needs practice with and doing that we're able to take kids in five lessons spaced over a period of about two weeks and they go from scoring 30 to 40 percent on standardized testing for this skill to the point where they're scoring 60 percentile if we give them the non-personalized robot or more than 80 percentile if it personalizes to them. That robot can do things that teachers in the classroom can't do. They're not embarrassed to say it in front of the robot. They are embarrassed to say it in front of the teacher. Sometimes when we translate, we're able to do something more than we could the first time around. One of our best examples of that is from bullying. We have some wonderful curriculum designed to teach third graders how to deal with bullies. But they're not being used in schools because no teachers want to use them. The curriculum are all designed around the idea that you act out scenarios. You say to one child, you pretend to be the bully and you pretend to be the victim and we'll act it out and we'll tell you what to do. You know what teachers don't want to do? Say, you be the bully, you be the victim. They don't want to do that, but we can do it with pairs of robots. And so sure enough, you bring in two robots, one of them's a bully, one of them's not, the victim, and you get kids to engage them. And sure enough, the kids respond and they engage, and the robots have to do things to make that translation work. Sometimes when we have one child, it's very easy to see. She's looking, there's the two robots off screen here, the camera's in between them. She's very engaged with what's going on. She's looking back and forth between the robots. But if they don't do something to keep that going, she gets disengaged and bored very quickly. But that's different when you have an audience. When you have three kids and they're engaged, they look at each other as much as they do the robots. There's a lot of interaction that happens between the children. And when they're disengaged, there's still a lot of interaction that happens between the children, but it often involves more slapping than anything else. <clears throat> so sometimes we can use these non-traditional roles. When we do this with kids with autism, we often have put them in the role of being the expert. We ask them to correct the behavior of a robot who has trouble with a lot of the skills that they have trouble with. And when we do this, if we try doing this with a person and we tell them, this is Laura, Laura's trying to learn these same things, can you correct her? That's not engaging to them at all. When we tell them, here's the robot. The robot's bad at this and is trying to learn. Can you help the robot? We can't even get them to sit down. They want to start right away. And in the amount of time that we finally get them settled here, he's already done three of the lessons with the robot. Here, we still haven't even gotten him started yet. All right. Wrap up with one last bit. Sometimes the way that we design social behavior, I've shown you a lot of very anthropomorphic things, but that doesn't mean that they have to be. 
Sometimes those social behaviors can come from extremely simple robots. This is a commercial robot called Sphero that's just a little ball, the size of a tennis ball, rolls around on the floor. And we designed the robot to provoke particular responses. So sometimes the robot is happy. Sometimes the robot is afraid. And it changes the way that the robot moves and the audio that it gives off. And it changes the color that it flashes. The robot can also get angry. And the one no one likes, the sad robot. But what's interesting to us is that these responses trigger very basic responses from typically developing kids, but very different responses from kids with autism. So here's a typically developing three-year-old who's running around playing with the robot, and it's a very social activity. And she engages not only by picking up the robot and playing with it, but bringing it over to other people. Here's a child with ASD who still picks up the robot, who still engages with the robot, but it's not a social activity. And even with this very simple system, where we have no complex sensing at all, we just have a simple force sensor, an accelerometer, we can actually see differences in the way that kids behave and they interact with the robot. And we're starting to do diagnostics based on those very simple things. All right, to wrap up, I told you that these things didn't work day after day. And in order to get to that point, we've had to build a lot of computational infrastructure. And we've just finally gotten to the point where we're starting to actually do this on a long-term sense. So starting in January, we'll be putting 30 robots out into 30 different homes for families with at least one child with autism. And we're gonna leave those robots there. This is the scariest thing I've ever done. Because I'm gonna drop the robot off on day one and I'm gonna pick it up on day 30. And we're gonna see whether or not we can actually stay engaging and personalized and whether it actually makes a difference in terms of what they learn. Not only whether they can respond to the robot, but whether they can take that skill and translate it to their interactions with their parents and with their families. All right, let me wrap up and say thanks to a lot of different people who have worked on these projects and tell you if you're interested, uh, you can check out a lot of the stuff that we do online. Uh, we post everything in the public domain. And I think we have time for questions. So thanks very much. Super talk, thanks. Um, do you have a sense for how small you can get the robotics and still have the embodiment effect? Yeah, so the Sphero robot, the tennis ball sized one, you absolutely get that effect. Um, we haven't seen anyone do it with something smaller, um, mostly because it's just impractical to build things smaller than that that have real expressive capabilities. Um, we know, for example, that you get um, embodiment effects with things that are um, about a f uh, eight to nine inches tall. Um, Corey Kidd did a study where uh, he had a little robot about nine inches tall, sat on your kitchen counter, uh, and coached you in a weight loss program. And half of the group, uh, half of their participants had the robot physically there. The other ones dealt with the same questions, the same uh, everything, only on a tablet instead of the physical system. Um, after a month and a half of use, um, everyone who was using the robot was still actively engaged in the program. Only about, I think, 30 or 40 percent of them who were using the tablet were still engaged in the program. So the embodiment effect had a clear differential there. Yeah. 
Hi, super, Hi. Uh, super uh, presentation. Thanks. Uh, two quick questions. The first is, um, so you talk about programming and, and code. What kind of code is that? Is there artificial intelligence, deep learning systems, et cetera? Yeah. And then I'm just curious, too, about the 30-day limit and why you chose 30 days. Yeah. So uh, there is a lot of artificial intelligence that goes into this, um, both on the sort of the perception side of how do we understand those social cues that people give off? How do we recognize eye contact? How do we understand what they're saying, the tone of their voice that's important? Um, but also in terms of how can we structure the response of the robot? Um, we do a lot of work in a domain called collaborative manufacturing, where the robot sits across the table from a person and they build IKEA furniture together. Okay, And that's a great task because it's something that you can train a person to do and we can train a robot to do, but you try to do it together and it becomes a very much more complex system. Um, and I'll actually show you really quick to answer that. Um, I'm prepared for that question. So uh, the idea of it is, let's see if I can get that up. So here's a person assembling an IKEA chair. Okay? This is something that the robot is actually watching and learning how to do this construction just by watching the person do it. So there's an, an element of learning involved in that side. Um, what the robot though has to do is it can't assemble things nearly as well or nearly as quickly as the human, but it can help support the person. So it learns things like, if you hand me the screwdriver at just the right time, that actually helps out a lot. Or if you recognize that I'm using the wrong tool and hand me the right one. Or if, for example, you notice that I'm having trouble assembling these two pieces and you stabilize and hold one of them steady for me. And these are all things that the robot learns to do autonomously. So there's a great deal of AI that goes into this. Um, some of it is deep learning, though, has a, is great for recognition type tasks. It's terrible for other tasks because you have no insight into why it happens. Um, it's also something where you can easily fool a deep learning based recognition system. Um, so, but there is a, a lot of AI code that goes into these things in terms of modeling the person and responding to them. Um, uh, in terms of your second question, which I got a piece of, but I, I missed it. Yeah, I was wondering why you chose 30 days. Why 30 days, that's right. Um, we How chose... Measured? What's that? The measurement of the 30 days. How are you going to measure it? Yeah, so we, we do a couple of things. We picked 30 days in part because it was a somewhat arbitrary. We could have picked 25. We could have picked... We haven't seen anyone do this successfully longer than four days. So this is a, you know, a, an order of magnitude step change for us. Um, so 30 was about the right number, but it could have been any arbitrary period there. just happened to be easy enough for us to remember. Um, in terms of what we measure, and, and this is why it, become, it needs to be relatively short, we measure a set of behavioral diagnostic markers in the children 30 days before they start, on the day they start, on the day that it ends, and 30 days after it has ended. So we take four assessments of the kids um, using standard behavioral measurements for the skills that they're using. Um, so these are standard diagnostic tools that we use. We're teaching four different skills, and we're using assessments based off of those four skills. Um, so those are things that we're looking for. First, their natural change over that initial the sort of minus 30 to day one is sort of how much they're being affected over time without the presence of the robot. And then from day one to 30, how much they're being changed within that month. And then we're measuring retention 30 days afterwards as well. Um, this, is, uh, this is a project that has been underway for almost two and a half years before the first person will see it. And that's one of the things that makes this work extremely time consuming and extremely difficult to actually carry out and fund is that it takes years of development to do hardware and software development and then to do good behavioral testing takes another year on top of that. And you treat that in a domain like computer science where a good graduate student needs to publish two first rate papers a year and this kind of study becomes very difficult to maintain. So that's the 30. 
Yeah. Yeah. Um, have you observed or measured whether the embodiment effect differs based on physical characteristics of the robot? And along that same line, if, if you have, does it matter whether the robot um, takes on more human characteristics? Yeah. So it's definitely the case that the physical form will matter. How much it will matter is really the question. Okay. So we know if we put a eight foot tall giant mechanical thing in front of you that says put the books in the trash can. <laughs> Our undergrads put the books in the trash can. And when the cute fuzzy thing says put the books in the trash can, there's a good chance they're going to put the books in the trash can, but not certain. So we know the physical form will have some impact, but there is always an embodiment effect. Every chance that we've ever seen, if we compare it with the same form in virtual systems, there's always an effect of that embodiment. And that's hard to do because anytime you're running a study having multiple physical embodiments, you've got multiple different kinds of changes that go on. Um, but we know that it's always different from what we see in the virtual. Um, in terms of uh, you know, what kinds of effects and, and sort of how small can we get, um, the study I mentioned earlier about uh, weight loss, uh, the robot that did that was about nine inches tall it had two eyes, but no. Uh, but it was a it was a box. It was like a shoe box, basically. Okay, no other anthropomorphic features. No arms. No legs. No mouth. Okay, um, there are probably some minimal characteristics. You have to recognize it as a social agent, and that doesn't mean having particularly human anthropomorphic characteristics, but it has to be a social agent. Okay, your toaster can't tell you, stay on your diet, and you're not going to listen to it. Okay, you've got to see it as a social agent. So that's a, a minimal set, for sure. Thank you for the great talk. Um, my question is, so most of the working social robots I've seen so far um, focuses on children. I was wondering what your thoughts on what makes that particular demographic as perhaps a lower hanging fruit in this? Yeah. And also the second question, follow up question is, if we were to um, expand this work to a different population, let's say the aging population, yeah. what do you think are, are possibly the, the key challenges for translating that kind of human to human um, behavior to human to robot behavior? Yeah, so there's a lot of work in the US uh, focused on children. Um, and that's most of the work that I do. But if we look at the community as a, a whole, worldwide, um, only the U.S. is focused on children. Um, there's a lot of work in Europe and in Asia that's focused on the aging population. Okay. Um, Japan in particular, uh, because of the demographics, they know that they are in for a very serious issue in the next 10 years, um, which is that all of the projections are that by 2025, half of their population will be above the age of retirement. There's a strong cultural taboo about importing labor. So they don't want to bring in caregivers from outside of Japan. And there's just a, a pure economic question of how do you operate a society when more than half the population will need care and support of some sort? And the answer they've turned to is technology. Um, so there are a number of social robotic systems out there. The best known of them is a, a little white seal-like robot called Paro. Um, and there's been extensive studies uh, for seniors in how that can support uh, both maintaining uh, social and communicative uh, function and also in terms of supporting aging in place. Um, it's one of the things that has been more successful in Japan and Europe in part because of cultural barriers here in the US. So when I say to a, uh, a, a Japanese man who is 70 years old, I say, I'm going to give you a robot that's going to help you age in place. And he says, that's fantastic. I won't be a burden to my family. I want every piece of tool and technology that you can give me. And when you say that to the, uh, my generation in Japan, they say, this is fantastic. What can we do to pay for this to give our parents that ability to stay where they are. And that response in the US is completely different. You say to the seniors or to 
the, the middle-aged generation, you say, we're going to give you this robot to help care for the seniors. And the immediate response is, that's so inhumane. You're going to leave the care of our loved ones in the hands of this metallic device? And there's this gut response to it. And so it's very much a, a difference culturally in how you perceive technology that's driving different levels of, of interest in different populations. But it's very much the case that there's a lot of great work out there. Um, if you want to search for the word PARO, P-A-R-O, um, and that'll give you a lot, of, a lot of great stuff on that. Thank you. Sure. Uh, thanks. I'm wondering if you think your work tells us anything about general AI as opposed to specialized AI, and if so, what? Yeah. Um, there's always the question in AI of, are you building something that's general, that's sort of multi-purpose, that's able to solve new problems, or are you building something that is very compartmentalized and highly specific? Um, it is the case that in the history of AI, what we have done successfully is to build those compartmentalized systems and not those general systems. Um, many people, and I fall into this camp, believe that no one has built a really general system out there yet. But we believe that the way to do that is to take seriously the idea that social engagement is critical to functioning intelligence. If you look at the way that we measure intelligence, the way we talk about intelligence, the way we conceptualize intelligence, it is extremely tied to social function. Okay. So just, just to clarify, I mean, what is it about social function that you think is yeah. uh, special? Um, I'm going to give you my version that this is not what you get from everybody in this area. Um, for me, social function is the way that you really learn. If any, you ask anybody in AI, what's the route to this general intelligence, they're going to tell you the system has to learn for itself. Okay. For me, socialization is really about being able to learn from other people. Um, you're not going to see that in, in any other way for us to build more generalizable systems. So I, I fall into the camp of people who say we should build things um, as Bethany said at the beginning, we should build things that have a minimal set of functionality and that learn to leverage more and more complex abilities. I started my career as a developmental psychologist. So the idea of building things like babies is exactly the kind of route that I think is a, a functioning one. 